starring Edward G. Robinson in The Doctor with Hope in His Hands. On the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. First, here's Gaines Whitman. Why not give your home a facelifting job now? Soft-toned pastel walls will add life and sparkle to your rooms. When the paint is DuPont's Speed Easy wall finish, you get more beauty for less time and little money. DuPont Speed Easy comes in 11 beautiful colors. It dries in an hour and costs less than $3 to do the average room in one color. You can apply it over practically any interior wall surface, including wallpaper. Use Speed Easy. It is one of the DuPont Company's better things for better living through chemistry. Pound Company presents Edward G. Robinson as Dr. Harvey Cushing on the Cavalcade of America. The practice of medicine is a religion. Its ritual demands painstaking technique in which no mistakes can be tolerated. Remember these three words always. Exact, precise, perfect. Exact, precise, perfect. Uh, it seems only yesterday that I first heard Dr. Harvey Cushing speak those words. And it was really yesterday that my son walked out of an army hospital, head all healed up, Honorable discharge, button all shiny, feeling fine and ready to build his life again. And it sort of came to me that brain surgeons couldn't have done what they did for him if it weren't for Harvey Cushing. Cushing. <laughs> I remember when I was just a youngster sweeping up the corridor at Johns Hopkins University Hospital back around the late 1890s. Dr. Cushing was just getting started. And how... I came down to see if you wouldn't kindly decide to answer my request. Uh, now, Dr. Cushing... It's been on your I... desk three weeks. Wouldn't be surprised if rigor mortis had set in. Uh, uh, Dr. Cushing, how can I answer a request that isn't clear? You want money for something discovered by, uh, uh... Who is this, uh, Professor Renkin? Well, Renkin is a scientist in Europe. Discovered invisible rays that go right through solid objects. Cause them X-rays. Uh, X-rays. Well, why X? Well, X means unknown. Uh, and you think, Doctor, that I should spend the hospital's money on X... Which means the unknown. Yes, but these x-rays work. By photographing them, you but can... But this is a hospital, Dr. Cushing. We cannot indulge Well, tell it. me, have you ever had a leg broken? Uh, uh, now, Dr. Violence... Well, if you had, you'd realize how hard it can be some, sometime to set the broken bone. With x-rays, you can take a picture of the damage inside a broken limb. You can... Uh... Uh, some doctors seem to be able to set broken bones perfectly well without these uh, uh, x-rays. Oh, yes, yes, of course, but... Uh... Suppose some youngster swallows a safety pin. As a treasurer, Doctor, I have to worry about little things like money, not safety pin. Well, if we show our patients how valuable... Uh, we... Doctor, hospitals are always short of money. Now, what hospital or what doctor will pay out hundreds of dollars for some unproven laboratory device? Well, I know some doctors who will buy that device. Oh, uh, you and your friends, Dr. Fisher? Exactly. Well, you must be serious. You usually say uh, precisely... Well, two admirable words, sir. You'll hear more of them as time goes by. You'll also hear more of x-rays. Good day, sir. That was Dr. Harvey Cushing in those days, looking ahead, always seeking some new way to help, to heal. And time has proved how right he was about x-rays. Then, a couple of years later, he started talking and practicing what amounted to a medical revolution. Yeah, a revolution that's helped save a whole generation of people. As revolutions go, this one started in a quiet enough way. Must have been an afternoon around, well, uh, 1945, uh, I guess. Dr. Cushing had gotten to know me. I was an orderly in his ward. Well, on this afternoon, the great Johns Hopkins University professor of surgery, William Halstead, was making rounds, uh, seeing patients... And asking questions. How are you today, young lady? Good, good uh, afternoon. Is the light too bright for you here, Geraldine? 
What, the window shade drawn? Well, she missed the sunlight, Dr. Halstead, so I had to move where she could see it. Well, that was thoughtful. Is Geraldine your patient, Dr. Cushing? Well, half and half, you might say. Dr. Cruz and I. We were taking turns, Dr. Halstead. I was away on vacation until yesterday. I see, Dr. Cruz. Well, goodbye, young lady. We're going to try to make you well again. I'll stop by later, Geraldine. Thank you, Doc. Goodbye, dear. Well, what's your diagnosis, Dr. Cruz? Brain tumor. Have uh, you had a chance to examine it, Dr. Cruz? Yes, sir. I agree. It's a brain tumor. And what's your decision, Dr. Cruz? Surgery. Operate and remove the tumor. Mm -hmm. Dr. Cushing? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I agree, sir. Surgery is Geraldine's only chance for recovery. Mm -hmm. That's quite a responsibility. When you consider nine out of ten brain tumor patients die in the operating rooms. Question now is... Which one of you shall operate? We don't operate fast enough, Dr. Halstead. I plan to make my incisions, remove the tumor, and be finished in less than half an hour. Well, and that's precisely where I disagree. Surgeons had to hurry for centuries, but now we can put the patient to sleep with ether or chloroform, so why keep up the terrible rush? Well, after all, how slowly can you operate? It takes only a moment to stick your hand in. Yes, and that's another thing. Why your hand? Are you hankering after my rubber gloves, Dr. Cushing? Well, sir, the medical world talks piously about the connection between microbes and disease, but in the operating room, many surgeons still use their bare hands. Oh, but rubber gloves are clumsy. I, I don't mean to boast, Doctor, but one would lose that delicate touch, wouldn't one? And one would have to operate slowly. No, you're wrong there, Cruz. If you dissect slowly and carefully, if you use fine instruments in the dry field, you reduce the damage to sensitive human tissues. The patient is sick already. There's no need to unduly disturb the delicate machinery of his body or brain. Pardon me, Dr. Halstead, but for modern surgery in the year 1905, that sounds terribly slow. Well, what is so wonderful about speed, Cruz? Young Geraldine back there only wants to walk and talk again. She doesn't give a continental how fast or how slow you operate. Oh, I didn't mean to ignore well, Of course not, but if you operate accurately and not too quickly, somehow, well... Somehow, nature has a better way of healing. And it's only good surgical manners not to rush old Mother Nature. You'd better schedule the operation, Dr. Cushing. I remember how the years went by. 1912. Dr. Cushing went up to Harvard as professor of surgery. And uh, I came along sort of as a professor of little odd jobs that have got to get done. At Harvard, Dr. Cushing would leave his razor-edged scalpels behind in the operating theater when he came into the lecture room. But he always carried the sharp edge of his tongue to slice block-headed students to ribbons. Uh, Mr. Wilford. Uh, uh, sir? Uh, let's say your patient's left arm is paralyzed. Which hemisphere of the brain might you suspect was injured? Right or left? Uh, I'm afraid I don't know, sir. Well, if you had even the simple ability to guess, Mr. Wilford, you would have had a 50% chance of hitting the correct answer. <laughs> Gentlemen, a good doctor should always intelligently calculate the odds he risks. The odds are so often against you that you will be glad to get even a 50-50 chance. You may sit down, Mr. Wilford. <laughs> and then, in 1915, Harvey Cushing examined his conscience and decided to leave both the lecture room and the operating room behind. And he went off to war in Europe. April 28, 1915. The German armies were smashing at the Allied lines in the Yip sector with machine gun fire and heavy artillery support. In La Chapelle, a few miles behind the blazing front, Dr. Cushing was operating on a French casualty. You feel no pain, La Foucard? Me, no. But uh, there is something inside my head, hmm? Oh, yes, at the base of the brain. Down, deep. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, move that uh, lamp closer, would be. Yes, sir. Uh, Cutler. Sir? Let me have the longest probe you have. The shelf fragment is about three inches down. Now, then. Strange, Miss Perry. I feel nothing, not a thing. Instrument too short. Any more probes around? Uh, no, that was the longest probe we have, Dr. Cushing. Uh, doctor. My dear Boothby? Yes, sir may sound crazy, but, well, how about a long nail smoothed off? Yeah. We could slide it into the wound to contact the metal shell fragment. The nail's metal, too, so we could touch a magnet to the other end. Mm. And then uh, pull out the magnetized piece of shell. Yeah. Well, I suppose uh, you don't mind my trying it, do you? Well, there's a risk, of course. 
Well, you don't worry about this piece of metal in your head. You mustn't now. We're steady enough. We'll try it. Then the excitement began. Anybody with a minute to spare came running from every corner of the hospital to see Dr. Cushing attempt this unusual operation. Now, uh, La Focade, you, you understand? Oui, Dr. Cushing, I must lie very quiet like a dead man. Oh, no, 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 very quiet like a live man. Oui, monsieur. Uh, Booster. Here's the nail, sir. Six inches long, smoothed, and sterilized. You have the magnet ready, Cutler? Yes, sir. Still now, La Focade, I want to slip this down along the track of the wound. Oui, je comprends. Slowly now. Slowly. There. There we are. I made contact with a shell fragment inside Booth 3. Uh, touch the nail with your magnet, Cutler. There it is, Doctor. Contact. Turn on the electric current. Now we'll... slowly... pull out the entire nail. And the... Oh. The metal. No. The magnet pulled out the metal from inside. No. No? No. Do you... Uh... Want to try the magnet again, Doctor? Well, I remember playing baseball at college, Dr. Boothby. We would never consider dropping out with only one strike against us. Dr. Cushing... Uh, don't worry, we'll try it again. Now, lie still now. Easy now. We'll slide this down inside. Now, start the magnet again, Cutler. Now. Out. Carefully. And... Oh. Nothing. Maybe the shell fragment is lodged so deep that... Once more. Uh, hold still now, Dr. God. I... I am very still like a, a statue. There. I've touched the metal. Uh, magnet, please. This time, I think we... Oh, no. The metal is out? We're out. Three strikes. Three strikes? Je comprends pas. Will you, uh... You'll be wanting the magnet anymore, sir. Oh, no, no, no. Take it away. I've tried every possible approach. Three tries. I'm finished. Yes, sir. No, blast it, I'm not. Bring that back here. Let's try this infernal magnet once more. They're perfectly still now, Mother God. We, oui, Doctor. All right, now. Steady. Steady, now. Turn on the current. Easy does it. Dr. Cushing? It's out. Oh, merci, merci, doctor. Yeah, you can keep this splinter as a souvenir. You are listening to Edward G. Robinson as Dr. Harvey Cushing in The Doctor with Hope in His Hands on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company. Maker of better things for better living through chemistry. As our second act begins, it is 1918. Dr. Cushing is sitting with an impressive looking officer in a command post along a shell parked road near the front in France. Dr. Cushing, why can't you make out your medical reports on those printed forms we have? Well, those printed forms are practically postcard, General. There's hardly room for the patient's name and number, let alone space to describe what's wrong with him. But writing up those exact and thorough reports of your cases takes too long, Dr. Cushing. We can't save time that way. Yes, but we save lives, sir. I'm sorry, General, I can't agree with you. Now, I've been a surgeon over 20 years. 90% of my brain operations were successful. And complete case histories helped make that possible. I appreciate that, Dr. Cushing. General, we surgeons are learning every day in this war. These case histories will help future surgeons save lives. I've always prided myself on an open mind, Dr. Cushing, but I can't... But, General, you wouldn't order an attack without giving your men maps, would you? Well, of course not. Well, sir, the human brain is still pretty much unmapped territory. And every military and civilian surgeon needs those medical maps. Hmm. Let's see. It's a new light on the thing. Very well, Dr. Cushing. Carry on as you were. Yes, I knew you'd agree if you have a fact, sir. Thank you. July 1918. Soissons, Compiègne, Chateau Thierry. 
Hindenburg's army tried one last smash at the Allied trenches, and the casualties started coming in. Dr. Cushing began operating on as many as seven, eight patients a day. Lie still now, son. Yes, sir. I'll try. Good boy. Oh, a nurse, always prepare the scalp carefully. Use precise aseptic precautions. Sorry, sir. I... Meticulous surgery under any circumstances means handling all tissue gently. Uh, syringe, please. Novocaine, one percent. Here you are, sir. How do you feel, son? It's funny. I, I don't feel a thing, doctor. Is, is that a German bomber upstairs? Yes, one of those big doses. Yeah, but nothing to worry about, though. He's been dropping that stuff in the circle for over an hour without any luck. Yes, but that, that could change any minute now. Well, just relax now, son. Oh, a nurse, you might try the same thing. Now, close your eyes, son. Open your hands. Yes, Doc. That's it. You won't feel a thing. Oh, a nurse. Yes, sir. Always remember, a few soothing words from the surgeon will help the patient relax almost as much as anesthetizing him. Did you hear me, nurse? Yes, sir. How about a few soothing words for the nurses? Oh, nonsense. They've got too much backbone and too much work. A miss is as good as a mile. Uh, forceps, nurse. That's how I remember Harvey Cushing. Teaching. By courage, by example, and by skill. Toward the end of 1918, with victory in sight for the Allies, after overworking himself for months, disaster struck Dr. Cushing. He wrote home to his wife about it. Dear Kate, I've been three days in bed with a not-yet-diagnosed malady. This came on top of two rackety days around Shadow Cherry, getting back home cold and wet in an open car, one o'clock in the morning. I'm quite wobbly in mind and body. Walking is very bad. Hands now almost as awkward and stiff as feet. Hands awkward and stiff as feet. Harvey Cushing, one of the world's finest neurological surgeons, was crippled by a painful nerve disease himself. When he came back to America after the war, he painstakingly trained his hands to operate skillfully once more. Now, a single operation would leave the sweat of exhaustion on his forehead. Yet his classroom lectures were just as full of life and pepper as always. Students, the practice of medicine is a religion. Its ritual demands painstaking technique in which no mistakes can be tolerated. Nothing is unimportant. Details may kill or may save a life. Everything is important. Therefore, everything must be exact, precise, perfect. That's all for today, students. Uh, Dr. Cushing. Dr. Cushing. Yes, Miss Allen? Uh, may I see you a minute? Well, I... Uh, it's important. Well, surely. Uh, come along with me now. I'm just going upstairs. Uh, Dr. Cushing, I... I think I'm going to leave school. Why? You're one of the most promising people in the class. Well, I've been thinking things over. The expense and the... Now, what's the real reason? They say there's no room for women doctors in the field of surgery. Oh. They say a woman surgeon hasn't a chance in the world. <laughs> well, when I was younger, they said a doctor should operate with bare hands, and in 15 minutes, they were wrong. But this is different, Dr. Cushing. At least you had a fighting chance to change those ideas. Well, let's, uh, let's pause just a minute. Uh, these steps. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to go so fast. Well, since the war... <laughs> My game leg. The polyneutritis ambulatoria. Mm -hmm. I remember your lecture on the subject. Well, I'm... Uh, I'm not in the habit of discussing myself. Quite the contrary. But as a student of neurology, you understand the painful and crippling effects of the illness which hit me in France. Oh, yes, sir. Well, when such an illness strikes, one can surrender. Or fight back against what looked like pretty hopeless odds. I gambled on fighting in the day I can operate again. And you think I ought to stay in school? Fight back, not surrender? Yes, yeah, stay on, work, win the honors, and go ahead to medical school. Oh, Dr. Cushing. Well, are you ready to continue our climb upstairs? The 
medicine, you know, speaks an international language. From the entire world, one brilliant young doctor after another came to study under Harvey Cushing. In 1929, Professor Pavlov, one of Russia's greatest scientists, came from Moscow to watch America's greatest brain surgeon at work in his operating room. Dr. Cushing, you are uh, using local anesthesia, no? Yes, Novocaine injected directly into the scalp. The patient will be awake. Uh, you will not object, then, if I sometimes ask him a question? Of course not, Professor Pavlov. Uh, gentlemen, uh, let me take this opportunity to explain that I believe Mr. John Caldwell, our patient, has a large cystic tumor in the left temporal lobe of the brain. His entire right side is now partially paralyzed. If my diagnosis is correct, and if the operation is successful, Mr. Caldwell will regain the normal use of the right side of his body. Uh, Miss Richards, the drapes, please. Cushing's operative technique was the religious ritual he taught. Step by step, the operation went ahead. Slender, shining scalpel, electric to fine, gilly saw, hemostat and sponge, until finally... Notice how thin the tissue is, Professor Pavlov. Remarkable. The dark lump down there, about the size of a lemon. Oh, that's the tumor. Yes, yes. Extraordinary. How are you feeling, Mr. Caldwell? Uh, quite all right, Doctor. I hear, but I don't, don't feel a thing. How far have you reached? Well, I've reached the tumor. Uh, Charles, wipe my forehead. Yes, sir. Would you like a stool to sit on, Doctor? Hmm? Oh, no, no. <laughs> no, thanks. Feel fine. <laughs> uh, steady now, Caldwell. I'm going to cut a little deeper. It's amazing how large the tumor is. Uh, doc, doctor, doctor, look. Look, look at my fingers, Doctor. I can just about move them. Ah, uh, careful now. The tumor isn't out yet. Uh, Charles. Yes, Dr. Cushing. Uh, uh, fix my headland. Uh, no, uh, a little to the left. I'm a bit tired. Here's a stool, Doctor. How about sitting down? Yes. Good idea. Thank you, Charles. How are you feeling now, Mr. Caldwell? All right. How far is it? Doctor Reach. In another moment, you and your tumor will part company forever. Yes, in a moment. There we are. Out. Zanichet. All right, Gil, you can close up now. Yes, Doctor. Absolutely amazing. Such skill. Do Doctor Cushing, I I can look at this, Doctor. I can move my right arm. Look, look now. Watch. Yes, of course. The tumor is out now. Dr. Cushing, now, now that I can move my arm, first thing I want, can I shake hands with you? <laughs> Surely. I'm always glad to see one of my patients getting well again. That's a brain operation. A field of surgery where once nine out of ten patients died during or after the operation. Now, nine out of ten patients, including my son, walk out of the hospital very much alive, largely because a very great man gave so much to medical science and summed up the practice in the teaching in these words. The practice of medicine is a religion. Its ritual demands painstaking technique in which no mistakes can be tolerated. Everything is important. Therefore, everything must be exact, precise, perfect. G. Robinson will return to our microphone in a moment. Now, here is Gaines Whitman. During the war, the United States, unlike other countries, took many young scientists away from their studies and jobs and put them into the armed forces. As a result, the nation faces today a grave shortage of young chemists, physicists, and engineers with advanced training. These people are vital to the future development and security of our country. 
To help meet this problem, the DuPont Company, for the academic year 1946-1947, has established 74 fellowships for awards to graduate students in science at American colleges and universities. The DuPont Company has made awards of this kind almost every year for the past 25 years, but is more than doubling the number for the academic year beginning next fall. The DuPont Company Fellowship Plan provides for 41 postgraduate fellowships in chemistry, five in physics, 15 in chemical engineering, seven in mechanical engineering, and six postdoctoral fellowships in chemistry for advanced work. Selection of the men or women to receive the awards is left entirely to the respective universities. Each DuPont postgraduate fellowship provides $1,200 for a single person, $1,800 for a married person, together with a grant of $1,000 to the university for tuition and fees. Each DuPont postdoctoral fellowship carries an award of $3,000 with a grant of $1,500 to the university. There are no strings attached to the awards requiring these university men and women to come to work for DuPont when they complete their studies. We hope some of them will, but they are quite free to enter any field of activity they choose upon completion of their advanced training. It takes long years of study to become a scientist, and young men and women who dedicate their lives to the pursuit of knowledge in the exact sciences often do so at great sacrifice to themselves and many times to their families. These fellowships are designed to make the road a little less rough. They are available in the academic year 1946-1947 to graduate students at 45 universities across the country from the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Now, once again, here is our star, Edward G. Robinson. Thank you. Our thanks to you, Eddie, for a wonderful job. Well, it was a pleasure, Gain, to play Dr. Cushing. He was more than a great surgeon. He was a great humanitarian. Incidentally, Eddie, it's, it's a far cry from your role in the current Diana production, Scarlet Street, in which you turn in another great uh, solid gold performance. Oh, well, thank you. And uh, <laughs> didn't I see you and Dick Ferran in a huddle last week? I guess he told you that he and Gail Page would be in next week's cavalcade. Told me. I couldn't get a word in edgewise. He was pretty excited about it, and I don't blame him, Gain. The story of the Alaskan bush pilot is the story of pioneer air transport in a mighty rugged co uh, country. I wouldn't mind playing it myself. At any rate, you'll be listening, Eddie, won't you? I'll be listening, Gain, and rooting for Dick Ferran and Gail Page. Good night. <laughs> for tonight's DuPont Cavalcade was composed and conducted by Robert Armbruster. Our play was written by Bernard Dreyer. In the cast with Mr. Robinson tonight were Ian Wolfe as Charles, Howard McNear, Bill Johnstone, Jack Moyles, George Sorrell, Sammy Hill, Ann Tobin, Ed Max, Jerry Hausner, Ramsey Hill, Sidney Miller, and Jimmy Eagles. This is Tom Collins inviting you to listen next week to Alaskan Bush Pilot, starring Dick Ferran and Gail Page on the Cavalcade of America. Brought to you by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.